thank you. I'm, I am not the sole organizer of, of our Elixir Krakow meetup, but <laughs> there is a bunch of people there. Uh, so shout out to them. It's a really cool meetup. It's streamed on YouTube, so if you'd like to watch, then uh, you're very welcome. And um, we, since uh, React Membrane are reaching uh, the point where we are ready to release 1.0 version, I thought there is a good time to like share some um, lessons learned from developing this framework. Uh, so this presentation will be about building a framework. It's going to be a little bit opinionated, so be aware. And uh, yeah, let's get started. <clears throat> so. Well, let's build a framework, but what's actually a framework? Let me show you an example. Um, here we have a snippet that uses a great library called Image that is um, capable of doing uh, some fancy things with images. And what it does is basically showed here. It puts a text on an image. And um, let's see what happens here. So first we call image open. Uh, so we tell the library to open the file. Then we create a text instance. Then we tell the library to compose um, this text. And then we tell the library to write it uh, to a file. So each time we tell the library what uh, it should do. On the other hand, um, here we have another example of a Phoenix Live View. So here's an implementation, simple implementation of Live View where we implement callbacks. And then once we implemented this, the callbacks, and then we take the module we created and we put it here to the Live macro, I guess. Um, and then uh, we basically tell the Live View, here is my implementation, let's do your work. So we give the control to Live View. And I think that's, uh, what uh, like is quite characteristic for frameworks that we don't have a full control as the users. Instead, we give the control to um, the framework. Uh, so basically, uh, I think this is usually achieved by providing abstractions, like here an abstraction over a live view, and uh, then either delivering implementations or requiring user to provide their implementations and some mechanism that calls those abstractions. So, well, is this approach good or bad? Well, of course, it depends. <coughs> it's for sure more complex than a simple library because, um, exactly because we don't have, the, the user doesn't have control over the flow. That means the framework has to have control over the flow. That means we have to implement how to control the flow of things, which is complex. Um, it's also generic, usually. Uh, so uh, that's, that's really cool because we have a simple abstraction, quite simple at least, and a lot, a lot of implementations. And whatever we um, create, whatever we implement, whatever feature we have that works with the abstraction, it will hopefully work with um, the, all the implementations as well. Uh, so um, if we make it too generic, it will be hard to implement anything that works with such abstraction. But if we implement it not generic enough, uh, then, then it might mean uh, that the user won't be able to accomplish uh, some uh, tasks they, they want to do with our framework. Uh, so it's, of course, important to create the abstractions properly. So how to do that? Uh, well, there are a couple of approaches. The first one I call trust your feelings. Uh, so basically, let's say we want to implement a chat framework, and um, we then we probably create some uh, behavior. There will be some handle message callback, handle user joint callback, handle user left callback. It feels right, yeah? So it should work. Uh, another approach is uh, to get inspired by other tools that are created in other ecosystems or that are uh, maybe not, that have maybe different assumptions that are a little bit different, but similar enough to get inspired from uh, them. Um, and the third approach is to have already have some implementations and build an abstraction, build some abstractions on top of, on top of them. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you have this uh, chat framework, then maybe uh, it's better to implement first a uh, text chat implementation and a video chat implementation, and then implement abs create abstractions on, on top of that instead of the other way around. Uh, so it's uh, quite, I think, generic takeaway that uh, sometimes is forgotten about. And the other important point is to know your abstractions. In Membrane, we have uh, elements and we have pipelines. We create pipelines out of elements. We link the elements together, and there is some uh, media processing in there happening. So we, of course, have an abstraction over element. 
Uh, so since we created it, um, then basically whatever feature we wanted to add to membrane uh, was uh, the, like the default behavior was to create an element. We have a good abstraction. Uh, it's quite generic. Let's create an element for this. Let's create an element for that. So we have elements everywhere. <coughs> yeah. And sometimes it's cool and it works. Uh, in other cases, we get something like this. So this is an example of one of our pipelines. <coughs> yep. uh, so, uh, well, uh, once we get to that point, uh, we thought, well, uh, maybe uh, let's figure out when to use uh, elements, when to create new elements, and when maybe there are better approaches. Uh, so, for example, we figure out a uh, rule that when you have two elements that are linked together and they are only usable in that particular configuration, in that particular setup, for example, you can't use them separately or then can, you can't use them linked in the other way, then probably they should become a one element. And if you need parallelism within that, then create your processes there. Uh, so uh, that's that's an example. A more general um, takeaway that I'm not sure is true, uh, but uh, I've seen that in many places is not to use abstraction for code organization. For example, not using processes for code organization can uh, is a good pattern. Uh, not using not using gen stage stages for uh, like for code organization or for reflecting your business logic. Uh, is also um, uh, advised. The same is uh, the case for membrane elements and uh, probably for other abstractions too. At least they are explicitly designed to organize code, of course. So how to create good abstractions in Elixir? Well, <clears throat> we already seen two examples of creating frame of uh, like abstractions uh, in Elixir in this presentation. The first one is, of course, the live view example. The other one is a Phoenix router example. So while Phoenix Live View uses callbacks to achieve uh, the uh, to, to provide the, the mechanism for um, implementing abstraction, uh, then the router uses macros. So it ha we have this scope macro, and we pass it uh, some arguments, and we pass it uh, and we pass to it as well the code to be executed. <coughs> So let's have a quick look at these two approaches. So callback-based interfaces are quite intuitive because they are everywhere. GenServer is callback-based. And um, moreover, there are some callbacks that are um, used in many places. For example, handle info callback, which is in GenServer. And it's used to uh, invo uh, handle all other messages. Uh, the same callback we have in GenStage, the same callback we have in Phoenix Live, handle info, and in Membrane, <coughs> We have handle other, yeah. We already changed that to <laughs> handle info in the recent release. Yeah, so back to callback-based inter interfaces. Uh, well, well, they are quite easy to implement. <clears throat> you just need to create a behavior, but sometimes they can be limiting. Uh, for example, we have a handle event callback in our element abstraction. That's usually used this way, so we are pattern matching on various events and handling them. And uh, the problem is, um, the rule behind this is that if an element doesn't understand or, or it's not aware of some event, then we need this uh, default clause to, um, to ca call the default implementation. Otherwise, we would get a match error, which is not what we want. So, of course, we could like inject this default clause, but this would no longer be intuitive. Is it would no longer work as it works everywhere else. So we decided not to do that and chose that trade-off. Macro-based interfaces, on the other hand, uh, are different from each other. Each one is different, so it, they need to be learned from scratch. And they are a bit difficult to implement because the ink with macros is difficult in general. But they are really flexible. I think that's why Phoenix Router uses that approach and can better reflect the API. And that's why they also give some better potential, for, have better potential for performance um, optimizations. Uh, so in Membrane, we chose the callback-based approach. <clears throat> so uh, we have a couple of concepts there that uh, helped us working with callbacks. And I would like to uh, quickly describe two of them, uh, actions and contexts. Uh, so um, for example, we have a handle stream format callback here, implementation. And it returns a list. And this list contains actions. 
uh, which are basically instructions what the framework should do. And this approach is cool because um, we can look at what the callback returns and we know what it does uh, at least in terms of the framework API. Uh, we can also use uh, these uh, actions in multiple callbacks. For example, here we send a stream format through an output pad and a buffer through the output pad as well. But in handle info callback, we also want to send a buffer and is the same buffer action. It's also good for unit testing because you don't need basically mocking. This concept is also uh, used in gen state M as, as far as I remember. Um, another concept here is the callback context. So uh, we have, uh, it's ignored here, and it's ignored in most places actually, but, uh, be, but that's because it provides information that are useful, but are not um, useful um, always, that, that, that are useful only in particular circumstances. For example, here we pattern match on the callback context, and we pattern match particularly on a given fields. And this approach um, helps us uh, avoiding having uh, like a 10 argument callbacks um, but because we just put that into the context map, put that information that is not uh, always needed, usually not. Uh, and uh, thanks to that we can also extend this uh, context uh, without changing the RET of the callback, which is uh, pretty cool for API stability. Um, another important point is uh, how to deliver uh, your fra the framework to the user. And um, in Membrane we have the core which contains the abstractions and the implementation of the core features and plugins that implement the core. So in this case we have to ship both uh, core and plugins. Uh, so what can we do to that? We can either do it in a single repo or multiple repositories, or maybe a better um, question is whether to do that with a single hex package or multiple hex packages. Uh, so we chose the approach with multiple packages because it, ha it has a couple of um, advantages. Uh, firstly, you basically, uh, thanks to that, uh, you only have in dependency, you only have um, the code what you, which you have in the dependencies. Uh, it's only the code that you actually use, or mostly. Uh, so you only have to compile what you actu actually use. Uh, also, you don't need to have all native dependencies installed because membrane, some memory plugins require you to have some uh, libraries installed in the system. If you, if you had to uh, have them all installed, that would be problematic uh, because uh, you would, we wouldn't actually need them. Uh, another cool feature is that uh, when you deprecate a package, uh, then, and you stop using it, the code is not there. Like, uh, it's only in that package and you no, don't, no longer have that in the dependencies. You don't need to compile that as well and uh, you almost can forget about it. Uh, well, <clears throat> but uh, I think the most important um, thing is that uh, we have, uh, thanks to that, uh, well defined relationships between plugins and that are, they are defined in mixed access file via dependencies. So we exactly know which plugin depends on what and thanks to that we can, for example, uh, quickly see that some plugin is dependent on many, many plugins and or many other um, utilities and it's like no longer modular. We also cannot have like circular dependencies, so this approach protects us from that. I think this also can be um, achieved by using the boundary library, but I haven't tried it actually. Uh, so um, unfortunately, having multiple packages also have, uh, has drawbacks. For example, you can have a dependency hell within your own framework. Uh, which um, has uh, which requires some um, attention not to not to let that happen, and uh, a maintenance cost associated with that. We have in memory some uh, automation that helps us bulk updating and releasing packages, without which it would be really hard to do. And um, moreover, in it increases the entry level. And what I mean is that when you visit a memory framework organization, you can see we have 144 repositories there. So you might think, well, this is a cool uh, amount of software. Uh, yeah, but you can also think, uh, where do I actually start? And um, I learned this uh, when I was watching a talk um, that was given by Chris Ertel a year ago at the Elixir Europe as well. And it was about implementing an Elixir audio uh, library in Zig. 
And so first thing uh, that I thought when I saw this, uh, wow, someone else, not me, is doing audio in Elixir and is talking about this, so it's pretty cool. And the other thing is, uh, why it, uh, wait, well, uh, why doesn't he use membrane? Uh, so <laughs> he answered this question directly. Uh, he said um, a couple of warm wo words about membrane, so that's why I can recommend you this presentation. Uh, but seriously, it's a cool presentation, uh, definitely worth watching. But he said uh, the membrane is too powerful because what he actually wanted to achieve is to play a honk, so a simple sound. Uh, so uh, actually membrane wasn't designed to play simple sounds, it was designed for serious streaming solutions. So, <coughs> yeah. But it should be fairly easy to play a honk with membrane and I really wanted to show you how, <laughs> but I won't <laughs> because <laughs> my laptop doesn't work with this <laughs> and, and I only have a presentation here. Uh, so uh, yeah, follow our Twitter, I will post it there. <laughs> um, oh, um, and uh, yeah, the, the, also the thing that I wanted to say during the demo is that uh, uh, we thought well, um, there is a, s a lot of power in membrane, a lot of cool features, but you have to alt add all these packages relating to this multiple package uh, architecture. Uh, so this is not really cool for experimenting with things, with trying things, because each m major feature you want to add, you need basically another dependency. So for playing a honk, uh, we require three dependencies, as far as I remember. So what we did, we um, just created a package that we called GigaChat because it brings a whole power of membrane to you within a single package. So <laughs> currently it has some problems because you, for example, need all this uh, stuff in system that uh, membrane requires, but we are going to make it more, um, more compatible, more useful. Uh, so for experimenting, like in Livebook, is very uh, um, it's it's some uh, idea. I hope it will uh, actually work. It's experiment for now. Uh, so um, decreasing entry level is also um, great um, for, for decreasing uh, entry level. Uh, also, we need demos and Livebook demos in particular. We are working hard in Membrane to provide you with uh, more Livebook demos because Livebook is very like friendly and welcoming, so it's a very cool software to make your framework friendly and welcoming. Uh, and we also try to approach this problem for an, uh, from a different side. So we create open source products. For example, um, we created Jellyfish and released that uh, it a couple of days ago. Jellyfish is a media server that um, accepts various protocols, though those in green are already supported, those in red are in progress, and some SDKs to uh, easily like um, route the traffic uh, sent and received via different protocols. And also, um, yeah, check it out uh, at GitHub. Uh, we also created a um, video room, which is a simple uh, tool for video conferencing. We are using at, at work instead of Google Meet. And uh, uh, yeah, this is like open source. You can check it out. You can play with it. You can see that um, see the code and verify that uh, membrane can with membrane you can achieve something actually working more than playing a honk. Uh, so, yep. Um, another uh, thing uh, I'd like to mention um, here is uh, the um, 1.0 problem. Uh, so we have all this cool stuff, a lot of features, we have uh, demos, we have even some production releases. Uh, so um, is it time to release 1.0? So let's see what semantic versioning says about this. Uh, it says that major version zero is for initial development and anything may change at any time. And the one, version 1.0 1 defines the public API and uh, then from that point you have to change the version accordingly uh, when you make the changes to your software. So two takeaways uh, from here. Uh, the first one is actually we have the semantics in our versioning starting from 1.0. Because before that, every, every, anything may change at any time, so the version doesn't give us really information what actually 
uh, we should expect. And the other uh, is that uh, it only says uh, about API. It doesn't say anything about maturity, about being well tested, about being, um, I don't know, having um, welcoming interface. It only, it's only about API. Uh, so uh, the question is, when should we release 1.0? Uh, well, the server answers that as well in a FAQ section. So if your software is being in production, if you have stable API, if you are worrying about backwards compatibility, you should probably already be 1.0. Uh, so uh, why aren't we? Uh, well, <laughs> we didn't think about this <laughs> earlier. <laughs> That's the answer. We had uh, like features to implement, uh, so <laughs> uh, so. But, but we thought about it about half a year ago. Uh, so we started to work uh, towards that, and uh, we released uh, 0.11 version. That was about API polishing, changing handle others to handle infos, and um, we also released um, 1.0 RC. Uh, that um, has some missing parts in the API. For example. Uh, uh, that fills some mix missing parts in the API, for example, unlinking two elements without removing any of them. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we also added some breaking changes there, uh, because, uh, yep, and, uh, and that turned out to be pretty uh, problematic, because when you release a risk candidate and it has a breaking changes, it's hard to test like in a real product because you have to adapt to these breaking changes and you're not sure if this risk candidate actually works. So in the um, potential problem with running back those changes is uh, quite uh, big. Uh, so uh, we actually didn't have a good opportunity to test this risk candidate we, while the risk candidate is all about being tested, being verified. Uh, so that's why we are going to release 0.12 version, which are going to bring um, not full, but at least uh, partial backwards compatibility, so we can better test the changes we made, um, the new features and um, the test for regression um, that uh, comes with uh, things that are going to be released in 1.0. And we are going to release another release candidate along with that. So a takeaway from this is that uh, when you have to break and you have some breaking changes and you have some features and you can put it in put them in separate releases, then definitely go for that <laughs> uh, because uh, that's way easier to test new, the new features, test for regression, and the API changes alone don't have that much potential of uh, failure. Uh, so, when are we going to release 1.0? Well, soon. <laughs> uh, the answer is we have pretty much implemented everything that we need, but uh, we are going to verify that it actually works. Uh, so, uh, the better answer is follow us on Twitter. And that's all I prepared today. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Mateus. Yeah, great talk. Uh, I think we have time for one or two questions, and then no, no, apparently not. So yeah, yeah, uh, I guess I, I am around. So feel free to reach out to me. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Thank you. Thanks again. You know.